All right, everybody. This is episode five. Episode five of Writers and Fighters. This is a podcast where I interview authors of all kinds and people involved in combat sports. Today I got a writer on. Today I got a poet, John Fry, the author of With the Dog Star as My Witness, a great poetry collection uh, by a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine, uh, John Fry. We, we went to grad school together, uh, but this, this book is, is quite powerful, and it's one of those where he, John is really brilliant in the way he works with form on the page, and when we talk, we, we talk about those kinds of things a little bit. We talk about the inception of the book, uh, when he started it. We we talk about the book cover, which I think is a, a really nice one and it really suits the book. And he gives us a little bit of a story on how that came to be. And, and it's a good one. It's a really good talk. Uh, but before that, before I get to the conversation with the poet John Fry, uh, there's a UFC event on... Like in a few hours, UFC 257, which features Conor McGregor in a lightweight match in the main event against Dustin Poirier. And it's a rematch. So they'd fought uh, several years ago now. It was one of McGregor's early fights in the UFC when he was coming up and was really making an impression. Uh, And that time he had predicted that he was going to knock him out in the first round. And he did, and that was like five, six years ago, maybe six or seven. And that was actually one of those moments in the that that Conor McGregor became, uh, you know, started to become the superstar after the match. He he said that you know I I said I was going to knock him out in the first round, and I did. So you got to start calling me Mystic Mac because I predict these things, is what he said. And uh, it was uh, again one of those moments that really launched his career. Since then, in the five, six, seven years since they last fought, Dustin Poirier has racked up some uh, impressive wins. Um, I mean, also some, you know, uh, notable loss to uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov uh, at the end of 2019. But he beat Dan Hooker, who is uh, in the co-main event, uh, in a unanimous decision. And it was, again, a fight of the night, really good one, uh, last summer. And so it's a good matchup in that, okay, well, yeah, it's a rematch, but they're, neither of them are the same guy that they were uh, during their first match. Uh, Conor McGregor in their first matchup was quite cocky, uh, a lot of trash talking. Uh, I saw them at the weigh-ins just for this match, and Conor McGregor was super cool very respectful and complimentary, um, still asserting that he's going to win and knock him out in the first round again, but also giving him credit uh, for his wins and and, uh, charity work even, and I guess Conor McGregor's arranged to make a big donation to uh, one of Dustin Poirier's uh, uh, um, charities. And so there's an interesting level of respect this time around, which wasn't there uh, the first time. Um, and that's okay this time around, I think, because you don't need that. This fight is going to sell itself. People, again, need things to watch and things to get excited about, uh, during strange pandemic times. But, uh, this is one of those where, um, the, the, the fight's going to sell regardless. Conor McGregor is the biggest box office draw when it comes to mixed martial arts. Um, so I want, I mean, I want, I want Poirier to win. I think it it shakes things up in that division. Um, I think he's a more well rounded fighter uh, overall. Conor McGregor does have that lightning fast and powerful left hand, which which means he can win at any at any moment if if he picks his right shot. But I do like Dustin because he's he's durable and and really is, is a again. A, one of the top two or three in, in that division for sure. And I like the underdog story. I like the underdog story. I think uh, Conor McGregor needs to get off his, uh, get off the pedestal for a bit and uh, 
there's ways to do that um, in 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 the uh, in mixed martial arts by uh, having a decisive win over him. Because uh, there is a lot of complaints about Conor McGregor getting certain shots that other people may not get, and how much leverage he has with the company. Follow the dollar signs, you know. It's not surprising. I, I don't agree with it or anything, but um, follow the dollar signs. He makes he makes the UFC and himself uh, a lot of money. Um, Co-main is Dan Hooker and Michael Chandler going to be uh, an, a, another good one. Uh, I like Dan Hooker in that one. Uh, he's been quite impressive, um, you know, even in losing to to Dustin Poirier, uh, which was his last one. Uh, but beat Ally Aquinta, um, who else? Paul Felder, and I'm, uh, the others are escaping me at the moment. But uh, yeah, another solid lightweight, another solid lightweight, and again potential for like a fight of the night kind of thing. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the last two matches, again, are going to be competing for fight of the night, I imagine. Uh, what else is up there? Uh, Jojo Calderwood, Joanne Calderwood, bad mofo Jojo. I like her. Um, she's a uh, Scottish, a uh, great Scottish uh, fighter. Flyweight. She's going up against Jessica I and... and not like a doesn't seem like to be like a title eliminator or anything like that. Even though Joanne was in line a while back, um, and I like JoJo to win that one. Uh, Jessica is a tough one though. She uh, she's been around for a minute, and uh, yeah, yeah, good. Um, good fighter. She went on a losing streak a few years ago. Um, and, and again, one of those were one of her recent losses was to Valentina Shevchenko. And is that hardly, is that even a loss, you know, um, that, you know, she did take a, a brutal head kick there. Um, but she fights, uh, she fights, uh, she fights at the top of the division. Uh, so I, I hope that's an exciting one, an exciting one. I don't know the guys in the middleweight, uh, contest. Which is a uh, Mahmoud Muradov and Andrew Sanchez. I don't. I don't know these guys, um, but middleweight's great. It's, I, I, I think there's lots of action in that division. Uh, Amanda Rebus is a fan favorite, and she's fighting Marina Rodriguez at strawweight 115. Uh, and Amanda Rebus is very likable. She's she's coming up. Uh, she is Brazilian. Um, uh, she's great. Uh, great fighter uh, has a win over uh, Mackenzie Dern and Paige Van Sant, which were which are you know some of those uh, uh, Mackenzie Dern being one of those up and comers. Paige Van Sant was well established by that point, and that was actually her exit from the UFC when she lost to Amanda Rivas. Paige Van Sant lost to her, and Paige is going over to uh, the bare knuckle fighting championships and. I'll have to do some talking about that at some point. Uh, but it looks like a good card, that UFC 257, uh, particularly the, the lightweight matches at the end of the card in the main and co-main. Uh, yeah, and, and so I'll be tuning in to watch those. Uh, so that's all I really got for that. Don't want to belabor the point. Um, and so next is the interview portion. Next I have the interview portion of the podcast where I interview John Fry, the poet, uh, the author of with the dog star as my witness. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Thanks. All right, everybody. We are in the interview portion of the podcast, and I'm sitting screen to screen with my compadre, John Fry. John, tell us what's been up. Oh, well, like, you know, like many people, not like many, I think like everybody, I have, you know, been figuring out how to live all of the dimensions of my life in a much smaller space that I'm accustomed to, which is, you know, personally, professionally, artistically, even what community means, being with others, you know, it's, to- it's all gotten smaller. I'm in San Antonio, Texas, and where, you know, we almost, but didn't quite get snow a couple days ago. Oh, like, darn. 
was it was it yesterday or the day before? But whatever day, all of our MFA classmates, you know, were posting about snow in the Austin area. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it kind of it it fleeted just a little bit. But then it, you know, just it was it became rain. Um, so we just missed snow, oh. which I'm sure you either have right now or are, you know, yeah, yes. in between. Yeah, snow's been ruining my life up here in, uh, you know, Salt Lake City. Um, yeah, no, it's been a mild winter. My first one up here was 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 pretty crazy. It was even un- unseasonably uh, cold and snowy for for here. But this one's been pretty mild. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, I saw the the social media blow up of Central Texas snow, man. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and it and it stuck around long enough into the day, or well, probably overnight too. I mean, but it stuck around long enough for people to you know actually build snowmen. No, oh, yeah, no people. No, yeah, and, um, yeah, and they were they weren't you know all that, that it stuck around long enough for a good photo, you know, and um, <laughs> um, which I mean is certainly fun to see. But yeah, um, San Antonio is kind of where I have been, or I guess the kind of core core parts of my life has revolved around for, oh goodness, um, I mean about a little, I mean more than 10 years. And so um, even though I have spent periods of time, and if you, hear, if you hear a dog barking in the background, you might just a little bit, um, that's my dog Toby uh, guarding the house. Um, you know, a dog is walking by a neighbor. <laughs> that's, that's okay. you know, he's, that's how he rolls. I don't know if it's the Labrador in him or what exactly, but I have, um, I've spent periods of time away from, away from San Antonio, but it's, um, I guess the place that's kind of come to be, to feel like home to me as an adult, not really having a long term one growing up. And, and so where um, where so, but, so you're not from so are are you from Texas are you like born in Texas or born you're not born in San Antonio then born no um um I was born in Kentucky when oh, my right. dad was in seminary but my dad is a born and raised Texan oh I see and my mom um and he's from Burnett originally okay kind of north by west north by northwest of Austin um in the hill country. And my mom was an army kid, but her parents retired in Texas. And so I have lived, say for college, some college years. I mean, I've lived all but like six months of my life in Texas. And so it's interesting uh, how yeah, people, and, how people define what their hometown is. Right. And it's like, for oh, you, it seems to be like yeah. your formative years, like that's where home is. Me too. Like El, El Paso was like high school and college, right? Like, and so El Paso. Well, and as an adult, me. right? Again, adult form. My, my adult, yeah. And I mean, like growing up, aside from early childhood, which was kind of still in the San Antonio Austin area, you know. I mean, it was the three, or, like the four years I spent in West Texas in San Angelo. Or at least what to me then that it was like West, West, you know, <laughs> West <laughs> Texas. West. Um, and, you know, in late elementary, junior high, like going into my teenage years and then going to high school in Kingsfield near Corpus Christi. It wasn't until I was in college in North Carolina that I realized like how profoundly becoming like a, a young adult, how deeply South Texas shaped and formed my sense of what home is the places where I, you know, where I feel like I belong, which was ironic because I was trying to get as far away from the small town mentality and like desconocimientos of being like in a little place where everybody knows your business, you know, and it's a tiny town and the, you know, and you're a preacher's kid and you're a gay preacher's kid. And like, as soon as that secret gets out every you know everybody's going to have something to say why would the gay preachers like, like, why would the gay preachers kid want to leave the small town though oh like, you know, like, I like mean, a, you know like how are you going to become a sexually Jesus. liberated person Jeez, and that you know in that context For sure. and, and so um but anyway but it was in it was in north carolina that i realized that there was just like a a kind of deeper than deep 
sense of identification, um, identification with or belonging to, um, I realized I came to feel, um, I mean, for, for South Texas or what, or, or like, I mean, like what Anzal Duo would call La Frontera. Right. Um, and, and, and like my next um, question, my next question was going to be like, well, what does South Texas, like, what's the importance of, of place in your life? And then in your, in your writing, specifically your poetry. And so you answered that first part of it really about that South Texas represented that part of you becoming you. That, that identifying mm-hmm. like who I am, where I want to be, who I want to be, I think that's really interesting. And so, how does that, or does that, spill over into your voice as a writer, or how much I should say? Um, I think in in every obvious way, I think it does. Um, and I mean, in, in an unobvious one, unobvious ones too. I'm sure. Um, I mean, you know the like to kind of go back to like the ironic thing that you don't realize until however, you know, however many years later, I thought that, you know, in that small town in that, you know, in Kingsville, which I, I want what maybe in those years was around 30,000 people. Okay. I may be over underestimating a little bit, but it's small, a town, you know, a community of that size, you know, and I was not happy going into ninth grade that I, you know, that my family was moving there because my father was being moved to a different church. So I I felt like my world had gotten really small, but it was beginning in ninth grade, maybe spring semester of my freshman year. So this would have been 1998 um, into 1999. That's when literature or writing poetry like grabbed a hold of me and refused to let go and the words and the relationship with language or the affinity to sensitivity to that preceded writing in that way you know because I mean like in my beginning was the word rather literally (laughs) (laughs) preacher's kid you know the church religion god the literature part for me began with The Color Purple by Alice Walker. And the writing part, the writing poems myself, um, that originated with um, the lyrics, song lyrics and poetry of Jewel, the singer Jewel. Okay. You know, Who Will Save Your Soul, You Were Meant for Me, oh, cool. Her Book A Night Without Armor. I want to say that that was like one of my Christmas presents in eighth grade and i remember seeing her music video the music video for who will save your soul on mtv like when she was just becoming sure. the, a thing like alanis morris said and yeah. you know um but you know for a while you know it was right you know i mean it was rhymey like keats and shelly and you know and then it kind of was free verse like because I was writing an imitation of her. Um, and then free verse and modernism, like that that kind of, you know, came later. But um, as you studied. But probably, I was, yeah. uh, I'm that, sorry? That, that stuff probably came up as you became more well-read and started to study. Yeah. Um, and, and it, and it, I mean, and it was also in many, many ways, uh, thanks to the English teachers um, who happened to be teaching at the high school at that time, um, each of whom um, in differing but just profoundly supportive ways, um, you know, like read, would read like poems I wrote if I wanted to share them with them. Um gave uh gave me book recommendations i mean oh that's huge the 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 woman um who was my ap english teacher my junior year she is the one who saw me reading the color purple and asked me if i had read their eyes were watching god and i you know and i said no you know i i haven't you know who you know who wrote that and she so she told me so i went to the library and checked it out and then I read that one 
And then I went to her, went back to her and I was like, hey, you know, I read this. Um, and of course, encountering Alice Walker, I mean, as I continued to read Walker, I mean, then like her stint came up eventually. But so I said, you know, I read their eyes were watching God. And she said, well, you know, have you have you read any books by Toni Morrison? And I said, no. Um, and so, you know, so then, she, you know, I went off and, you know, did that. Um, you know, and, and it happened with other writers as well. Leslie Marmon Silko, for example, you know, she asked me if I had read Ceremony. And so I did, you know, I didn't, you know, and I did. And then she let me borrow her own copy of Almanac of the Dead yeah. so that I could read it, you that's know, a, afterward. Um, that, you guys, like, that's a good early start, man. And you're lucky and to that, have... I mean, you're lucky to have and, teachers like that. It's awesome. And and so in a way, um, you know, South Texas, like, you know, not quite the valley, but a little too far south to be like this area. I mean, even though, yes, I mean, there was like long yeah. standing, vibrant, you know, Mexican community culture here for sure. Um but, you know, but it, it was like in this small place that like that my that I was given glimpses into um, like worlds that were larger and more possible. You know, when it happened within, you know, in that frontera context. And I mean, and the other I and I guess the other thing about that that's crucial um, is that I when my family, when my parents moved back to Texas, um, when my dad finished seminary, the first church that he had was in Alice, Texas, which is like a half hour from Kingsville, but like everybody is south, everybody is close to the coast, humid is all hell, all the damn time. And like Kingsville also, far enough inland that you don't get the constant breeze and wind that you do like in Corpus, like, like in Corpus, you know, it can be hot as fuck, but the wind is never too far away, no, usually yeah, sure. in some way, sure. which makes it a bit easier to deal with, not in Kingsville. Right. Uh, but anyway, so they moved to Alice, you know, so when I was about six months old and they were, I'm trying, I don't remember if they spent a, like a year, but anyway, but we were there until... I was about a year and a half, maybe close to two, just or just a little over two years old. And and because my mother didn't work at the time, but because she also, you know, so anyway, they were at the church a lot. Um, and when they were doing different kinds of stuff at the church, um, you know, if they both, you know, like like if I needed to be taken care of in some way for them to do that, um, of course, you know, I would was in the nursery and the woman who worked in the nursery um, was um, an Awamita type. Her name was Elva, E-L-V-A. Probably, I don't, I don't know exactly how old, I mean, but you know, let's say probably like late fifties, maybe you know, into sixties. And she didn't speak much English. She understood it fairly well. And, and I think at the time, like I was the only infant in the church so like on Sundays I mean like I was pretty much like the only little baby around so and she is the one who took care of me you know during this time and did it from like when I was six months old well and of course and you and I both know that you know that you know however you know an abuela might talk or um interact with a baby like when a white mother is around, when the white mother is not around, the abuela is not going to be speaking in English, right? I mean, like, you know, she's going to be sure. speaking to the baby in Spanish. And, and of course, I mean, and I don't, I mean, maybe there's like neuroscientific evidence for this, but the poet in me doesn't care. Um, you know, even though I'm not a fluent speaker of Spanish, um, semi-fluent maybe, even so, Spanish has never felt like a foreign language to me. Like I can never remember a time, uh, you know, in a sense like where it, where it seemed like something that was, I, I wasn't capable of understanding. I mean, like, I, I just like 
it just it felt fam- it's always felt familiar to me. Where you grew up in lots of Texas is very clearly a bicultural and bilingual right. space, even for the white folks. And again, I have yeah. stories like that again with my homeboys back in El Paso, very similar, right? Where the language was never othered because it was always here. It was always there. It was yeah, always Yeah, I mean like like because you don't know anything else. Um Yeah. I mean and I mean and it's funny, you know, and it, it's it's an odd I mean, I guess a wonderfully odd, but it's an odd like socio sociological fact or like reality that white kids in my case like middle class middle middle class in the 80s and you know i mean and kind of moving up within those middle class echelons uh but anyway you know it's like at a public school where said white kid or white kids are very much in the racial minority themselves um you know so their surroundings um and like how brown everyone is around them um it's not that they don't notice it but like the presence of these other people um is always a part of what home is to them um you know where like for me when i went to north carolina 1600 person liberal arts college and like rich bitch college. I mean, and I, I mean, and the only reason that I will talk shit about the college and it's Davidson college is because I also love it so much. And I'm so grateful. Um, I mean, so it is not like bad blood anymore, uh, but it was just like, it was a big shot to the system. And part of the reason why was because there were just like, like, so many white people and and I like did I go did to, not did I go to school in, in in Sweden or where am I yeah <laughs> and and you know and how I didn't notice this when I visited I don't see how that could be possible but it, I didn't realize it I think you, you got, know you got to sit in those spaces for a while for it to really click I think and I think people again from the frontera regardless again because I had a version of that that I'm uh, wow like I didn't realize how brown the frontera was and how natural that is Mm. until you leave right Mm -hmm. and that happens Mm -hmm. to everybody from my hometown that leaves for a while like oh i'm sure everybody oh wow and it's it's like well like even coming here probably or like dallas or even even going even even from el paso to graduate school in san marcos and there it's it's like well it's grad school the further you go on in school the wider and richer it gets we know that um and so Yeah, but then a little liberal arts college in the Carolinas. Oh, boy. That's another story, man. Yeah. Well, (laughs) it was. I mean, I mean, but what it also taught me, because even there, there was a sizable contingent of Texans. I mean, from, um, but as I learned very, very quickly, the Texans were from Houston, Dallas, or Fort Worth. Sure. That area, um, Houston, and like more like Bel Air than the Woodlands. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, uh, or like if in San Antonio, it would be Alamo Heights. Right. Um, right. But, um, you know, maybe a couple, a handful from Austin. Uh, but like, you know, that is what Texas was for basically all of them. And so when I, t- when I, when I told them, you know, when, when I would say where I was from, uh, you know, they would look at me like, what? Uh, you know, like where? And I would be like, you know, like, you know, like near Corpus Christi. And I would, you know, even, you know, and I would have people, you know, even Texans basically say, you know, like, you know, they hear the word Corpus and then they're like Padre Island. I mean, it's like, yes, but that's true. But, you know, like, but like, you know, even if you go to South Padre, at certain times of year, I'm sure. Now, now, God is my witness. I may be mistaken about this now. But, you know, like if you go to certain parts of like Padre Island up near Corpus or South, down near South Brownsville, um, you know, um, you know, there I have no doubt that there are still areas that are, you know, like lily white now. Sure. You know, I realized really just really, really fast that, that, that they they had no concept of what I was talking about. When I said South, when I said South Texas, um, 
I mean, and it came down to language. And of course, I was too young to know until I got to college um, that Spanish to me and what I understood to be Spanish was really like that was really Tejano Spanish, sure. um, Tejano Spanish and or Tex-Mex um, and or Norteño, sure, Norteño Spanish, kind, you know, yeah. you know, Spanish. Um, and it wasn't until many years into, like into my 30s, having learned everything I'd learned since then, that even like the valley there's kind of like a valley dialect and vernacular and there's like a Laredo one uh -huh. and there's an El Paso 100%, one too. 100%. Um, and, you know, I mean, and it's only been in my, yeah, like, you know, like, I mean, like, like maybe in the last 10 years yeah. and it's because of relationships I have been in with men respectively, you know, or Mexican American men who are respectively, you know, from very different places like El Paso versus, you know, somewhere else, right. you know, that like those distinctions, yeah. like those, those kind of like finer gradations, it's, it's you know, fascinating. exist. But in college, I came to, I, I realized that one of the reasons I loved going to Walmart so much in then in college, which is not something that I would like ever expect to say or to think or feel. Um, and it was because the closest Walmart was like, 12 miles away up the highway and was in a much more like Walmart neighborhood. Kingsville minus the King Ranch billionaires, like more like working class small town. And that part of North Carolina, like so much of North Carolina at the time and still has a large, um, there's a large community of Central American and southern mexican immigrants in those areas um more so more so like that part of latin america than um the like what what i would be familiar with as mexico for example yeah. um that and that's where those families shopped yeah like that is where they went that is where the moms went with the kids sure. you know etc or you know like grandmother mother kids um i mean and i recognized that the spanish was different i mean it, it sounded different it, you know i was not i yeah. couldn't understand by you know every you know a lot or whatever um but you know but it felt i mean but like that felt familiar i mean like that felt like it reminded me of home because at home you know i would totally hear motherly or aunt you know a tia voice you know, like, Mija, you know, like, you know, like, you know, in the aisles of H-E-B or whatever, like, yeah. that's, that is what I would hear, you know, <laughs> or even interacting with an elder or an older adult man or woman, well, probably more woman, but, you know, like, let's say an older Mexican American woman, and being called Mijo or Mija by, or, well, probably, <laughs> I've never been called Mija, but, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> there's always the first time um but you know being called mijo by them as well yeah um no that that familiar I mean, just that familiarity and that connection yeah. to community and again the sounds i think are what you're hitting on are are really interesting there's a taco spot i go up to up here and oh, yeah. uh and there's a good it's, it's really good again menu the oh, one menu the one the weekends and if oh. they run out they're done you know no right. English, sure, sure. no yeah. English on the menu. And you go in there and I'm like, and you just hear the yelling, be, uh, make as, as they're making tacos. And, they're, and I'm like, I could be in El Paso right now. Like I could uh -huh. be. And again, it's like yeah. the after church crowd. Like I got there right before like the after church crowd and they come and there's like, oh, everybody kind of dressed up. But, and you see the whole family of five or six coming in and, and I'm like, this could mm -hmm. be the Valley. This could be <clears throat> McAllen. This could be Laredo. Because yeah. the sounds were so... Uh, and again, it was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, well, well, and like, well, in, in food, like, all of the sense experience in that is... I don't know that I had ever really thought about this until right now. But it is, like, it is such a powerful distillation or, like, image of 
all of the ways home feels. A hundred percent. The sound, the smell, the taste, um, but even just like the moment, not even including the eating, because you can smell the asada cooking, yeah. you know, like, yeah. you know, you can smell either the corn or the flour, tor- you know, tortillas. And, um, and anyway, that reminds me, and again, you'll appreciate this because you're a, a poet. I had a poet say one time, well, it was taking a class and we wrote a poem and the, the little prompt was to write a poem thinking about the smell of fresh bread or fresh mm. tortillas. Um, mm-hmm. And so we do our poems, and we're like, why was that the prompt? And goes on to explain that the sense of smell is the sense that's most attached to memory. Like, you ever mm-hmm. be, like, driving somewhere, and, like, you smell something, and it just takes you somewhere, or you oh, smell yeah. a certain aroma that's so specific, and it takes you somewhere... And so I think it's really interesting that you brought that up like organically and, and you are a poet, right? And again, as writers, we do lean into the visual a lot. Again, well, imagery. I love imagery. If I can, if good images sure. knock me on my ass, it's tremendous. But once you get the sound and the music, right? And, and you get the, um, uh, again, taste is a hard one. Texture is a hard one, right? Uh, and, and again, the, the well, memory. Well, smell. I mean, how I, do you I don't do that? How do you put that on the page? Right. I don't think smell is easy to oh, yeah. put on the page, which is frustrating. I mean, like it, it's like you it's know, part like, of life. That's the yeah. ch- that's the challenge because because I think for me it is as visual as my memory is, and it's funny that the love of the visual doesn't really express itself in any other way. Um, but smell is so potent for me. I mean, it, like, like I have difficulty even with foods that I know I like, like I have had them or I know that I would like it. If it has a smell associated with it, you know, that I find unappetizing. I don't know that I would say that I have like a sensitive nose right? in that way. But like, but if it doesn't smell good to me, it's really difficult for me <laughs> to want to eat it. Um, and I'm sorry to say that menudo is one of those for me. Um, I, or I have really, I have yet to have some that I wanted to finish. Interesting. Um, oh, that's my Now shit, like tripas, like I'm good. See, like, what's I mean, interesting, like, I barely jumped on tripas like two years ago, dude. Like I hate the, I hated the smell of tripas when my mom would make them for my old man, and because we wouldn't eat, we would eat something else. But it just smells up the house in that very distinct smell that I can't describe right now. <laughs> but like, and but that one grew on me or whatever. And so this is completely unscientific, but that association with memory and the smell thing and being maybe turned off by certain smells. I'm like, this isn't scientific, but like you know the college days when like you drank too much of blank alcohol. Yeah. Then a month or two or three, four later, you'd smell that alcohol and you'd be like, oh, hell no, no. And it's like, well, yeah. it's attached to memory and a bad experience. It's the smells or, attached or like, to trauma. You know, yeah. Or like, you know, I need a few years not ever having peanut butter. Those, or those kinds ramen, of things. Like, you know, or like a certain flavor of ramen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. My old man had this story of uh, when he first came to the U.S. and he uh, had to fix his car. And so he would just, he's like, all I would do is buy a loaf of bread and bologna. And so I could save money if I can buy, so I can get the car fixed. And he's like, my dad's like, I, I won't ever fucking eat bologna again. He's like, I'll never fucking eat that shit. And I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, since we're talking about writing and stuff and poems and whatnot, I'm holding your book with the dog star as my witness. And I love it because there's a, there's a wolfie on the front. There's a cool dog on there. Great artwork. Uh, do you know anything? Uh, what about the artwork on the front? Can you tell me anything? Or are they yeah, just like that for so, you? Yeah, um, so this is actually, and I, I mean, and I suppose we, we might think of this as a benefit or perks, at least speaking as a poet. I realize for prose writers, this could be, I mean, th- it could be a very different situation. Uh, but the perks of working with a small press this is artwork I actually chose myself that I wanted. Um, it's um, it's by um, the contemporary American artist Kiki Smith. 
the p the piece is uh called cathedral and and what it actually was she draws sculpts prints she basically does everything and i absolutely adore her artwork um and like and in the art world art world like she's a big fucking deal she's for real nice uh like you and I could probably never afford <laughs> the smallest thing, right? You know, like it's just not gonna happen. It's, it's it's not in the cards for us, and that's cool. cool. But yeah, she's that kind of artist. Um, um, and but anyway, but what it is is it was like a print on fabric, like a curtain. I can see um, that now. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, and so and this is one in a series. So anyway, I guess it will. It was not until the book or the manuscript was uh, was accepted for publication, Orison, where it had been a finalist, that I um, began to think about, like, if I had a dream cover, what would it be? Um, even if it was just to give the editor and publisher a reference point. I, you know, showed it to Luke Hankin, the, the, the publisher, and I said, you know, I know just kind of like with reprinting certain, po- you know, reprinting things by dead authors um, whose work is not in the public domain. Sometimes like people trying to make anthologies can include poems by really famous people because the family like wants so much money <clears throat> to be able to do it and whatever. Well, royalties in that way works, of course, with visual arts, too. And it and it's really ultimately at the discretion of the artist or whoever holds the right to that work. And so he, Luke, um, wrote Pace Gallery, I think it's the one, or Pace Weinstein Gallery in New York is the one that represents Kiki Smith, um, just basically querying, you know, we have the, we have this author, they really want, uh, you know, they really love Kiki Smith's work. They, especially this piece, you know, we are a very small independent press, um, you know, and, you know, and while maybe out of our reach, we just wanted to ask. And the gallery wrote back quite quickly, I think, and basically said, you know, hi, you know, thank you so much. We, you know, we love that he loves Kiki Smith, you know, and, you know, and for, you know, and for groups like yours in your situation, you know, yeah, you can use it for free. All we want you to do is have two copies autographed by the author, <laughs> like sent to, you know, sent to our office. Hell yeah. That's all. That's all we want. So like, I don't ever expect that to happen again. <laughs> that was so awesome. <laughs> and, no, it's and, so I, and I don't, and, 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 it, and I don't ever need for it to happen again either. Um, <laughs> and I mean, and, and the whole publication process itself, I mean, actually came about through a very similar kind of query letter after, um, I mean, like after the, after the winner of the prize that was a finalist for was selected by the, by the judge of the contest. Of course, I mean, of course I was, you might say doubly disappointed as far as learning that you're a finalist and then, you know, learning, okay, um, you know, it's not going to happen or whatever. Uh, I mean, but I, you know, I had sent it, I had sent it to Orison because it was the press that I felt as I could imagine it would be the best home for the book. I think that's um, important. I think, uh, again, cause I think that, uh, I, I, I love, I love small books from small presses. I really do. I think there's, uh, again, a, a certain amount of attention that's, that's paid to certain little things like that, you know, that mm-hmm. I've heard people say, Oh, well, nobody ever asked me about the book cover even once. Right. And then, uh, then I hear like, oh no, they're great and very gracious, and I was able to, you know, get hooked up with this photographer that I know, or or you. I we just reached out and they were happy to help. Yeah, I think that's good. You want to figure out like what is the home for my stuff, and you, you know who's going to have your best interest in mind in mm-hmm. terms of getting your book out there the way you want it to be out there. Right, right. And well, I, think you I should mean, be protective the, of that stuff. You should. Yeah, one hundred percent. In the sense of who will care for the work in either the best way possible or as you would want it cared for, you know, however you want to 
you know, however you want to be with that. Um, you know, the other thing that I was really lucky, well, I didn't know that. Well, actually, I did know this before, beforehand. You know, the other thing that I knew or that gave me hope was that I knew that they had published finalists as well before, or they had done it once. And, you know, and so because it was the place that I most hoped to place it with, and I had that, I was like, well, I mean, all I can do is, you know, all they can do is say no if the answer is no. And if the answer is not no, then, you know, who knows? You know, and so I wrote, a, 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 you know, a query, I mean, a kind of query letter. And I just basically said, you know, I thanked him for, you know, for the support of the work. Um, I, without being too forward, smarmy about it. I mean, I just said, you know, I, I reiterated um, how much I, I felt the press, it was the press. Mm-hmm. like for the manuscript um and i and i just basically flat out asked um you know i you know i you know but i contextualized oh, it sure, i did course. rhetorically contextualize yeah, writer, you know in yeah. terms of this previous finalist and i said you know you know you know i know you know i don't know how regular this how how often this happens uh you know but i would you know i hope that you will you know consider mine for these reasons, um, you know, I also, you know, admitted that, um, you know, I mean, that it is a manuscript that I had been working on by myself. Okay, so this would have been maybe sometime in 2016, maybe 2017, at least a year before it actually came out. Um, so around that time, you know, and I, I graduated in December, December of 2012. Yeah. So um, that's when I finished my MFA. So basically from that point on, um, you know, I basically, I probably revised it once a year uh, for those four years. Um, a couple of those were really radical, <laughs> like big time, like your throat is in your stomach and, hard as I don't know where you know kind of like writer decisions like cutting what feels like the whole thing and you know and so I just said you know I have done all that I know to do with this um and I you know and I believe that it would benefit from you know I mean I believe that it would be benefit from editing and I want and I want to let you know that I am open to that conversation and it and that very quickly turned into he he basically said, okay, cool. Well, in order for me to to consider this, some editing would like have to be on the table, or you know, you would need to be willing to negotiate to be negotiable for some of that stuff. And and he said, you know, I will go over the manuscript, let you know what my thoughts are, um, and and based on how open you are to some things versus, you know, others, you know, we will just kind of continue to see where this goes. Maybe I forget how long, but not particularly, um, you know, I got a package in the mail that was a printed out copy of the manuscript, hole punched in a binder with his, with his line edit. I mean, and so he, so he is actually, I mean, a poet who, himself and yes meticulous line edit comment and i think in all in almost every in every instance that i may I, that i agreed and made some sort of change which is not to say i mean well i mean i know that you know what i mean i mean it was not like invasive um or like offensively invasive like surgical cuts here. Um, but I think in virtually every instance I can think of, I mean, it made the poem better. And it that, made the line better. And that's the good um, editor, right? That's the good, a good editor. There's like the good copy editor is one person, but then the good editor like that is like, I mean, that's why I'm good at it because I can look at somebody's work and be like, what are they trying to do? 
And how do I mm-hmm. make those edits or suggestions in a way that helps them get to where they want that book to go? Right. Right. And and that's different than being like, well, I don't this isn't really my taste or style. And again, in the, the nature of editing or workshoppy kind of environments or anything where we're providing that feedback, we run into that danger of being prescriptive. And in a certain regard, you can't avoid some of that. But again, with that lens of what does John Fry want to do with this poetry manuscript and how do I give him suggestions to get it there? That's a different kind of editor. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't know how many of those people exist. I don't. I don't know. Well, um, but that's based awesome. on based on conversations I have had with other poets. It's very uncommon. Yeah. It is exceedingly uncommon. Yeah. Um, now, as as for what the ratio, as for the likelihood or less likelihood of it happening at either the big mainstream houses. Norton, FSG, Knopf, Simon and Schuster, whatever. Even like Persea, um, but so presses like that, um, or university presses, or imprints through university presses, um, and then you know you get into like the small press world uh, or small independent, where poetry wise, Grey Wolf and Copper Canyon are essentially the indie versions of Random House mm-hmm. and Norton for like everybody else down to the much, much smaller presses within the indie independent presses. Uh, and Orison is like an example of a, yeah. I mean, it's not a micro press, but no. it, um, you know, probably is releasing, this is, I feel like this is the question I should know, but you know, I mean, less than 10 books a year, but, you know, probably like seven to nine, you know, a book of fiction, a book of poetry, um, a yearly anthology has published nonfiction collection, but, um, you know, I mean, but I've had poets at big independent houses and I can't recall about the mainstream, but just have basically said that it does not happen much anymore and um, I mean, and some of them, I mean, expressed kind of wistfulness and frustration. Like, I wish, like, I wish that my editor, you know, or like, I wish hands-on. that they, I wish they would help me. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I've, heard that from, I've heard that from older generation, you know, the generation or two uh, before us and kind of paved the way that they're like, yeah, at a certain point, like you work quite closely with your editor and they're really have those conversations about what are we going for and and to the point where you know a really close relationship with an editor with some people this is a quote somebody told me that said they almost became like 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 co-writers or again like an assistant mm-hmm. almost and I'm like well that's interesting and that's helpful you know, some people want the hands off thing where it's like well this is it it needs to be ready to go and there's editors out there that's like well great I want to take that cuz I don't have to touch a word on it you know and mm-hmm. I guess you know but yeah I do think that you're right that it is kind of going away probably especially i'm sure more so with with prose i think so i think so i mean i don't know i think so yeah and and, you know and then you get into like you know you get into like popular novelist writers versus literary fiction you know and and how different if at all yeah i don't know um so this book uh so we're talking about this book and i think I think you should give us a taste of this book, man. Uh, I think okay. you should you should read you, something. Uh, I do want you have any requests. I, I was because you did mention some of the poems in the manuscript did undergo big revisions, right? And I'm always curious about that. Like, is there a poem in there that you can think of? Like, man, I really changed that one, right? But for the better, right? Like, I remember you know, losing pages and pages of a story and being like, oh, but it's better. But, you know, how painful it was to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. But I think that's interesting. And then maybe you could tell us a little bit about the genesis of it and then where it ended up. Incidentally, probably the longest poem in the book um, (laughs) is probably that. It's it's probably that one, Um, the, the, the Lazarus poem on page 83. It's a poem in three parts and, or four parts. 
good grief. Now I'm thinking like, okay, was Lazarus dead three days or was it four? I can't remember now. <laughs> um, but it's the number he was dead. Um, and, you know, so that is why it's structured the way that it is. And originally, I want to say that the earliest version of this, it was all in, it, it came out or the way that the form, the shape it initially took was in tercet which is one of the stanza is a stanza that has a, a shape, uh, a rhythm um, that, that just corresponds to my wiring really well. Um, I'm all, I also feel that way about couplets uh, and one line stanzas. Like I would say of all of them, those are the three that I gravitate to the most. Um, qua like for some reason, the quatrain feels blocky to me. Um, it feels like blocky and heavy and um, unwieldy in a way that we're like the tercet is sleek, it's smooth. But um, but anyway, and so it was segmented. The poem was segmented into sections also, but they moved around on the page. Well, and the other thing, the other thing at that point in time, um, it was a poem uh, that had punctuation too. There were um, commas, periods, dashes, various forms of either end stopping a line or um, inserting some sort of pause around words. And then the, the kind of like the, the final iteration, which, which looks like this, you know, I would say that probably happened within a year, within, within about two years of manuscript being accepted. Um, and it wasn't until within about a year of the book's publication that the poem um, that the poem was published. And this, and so the earliest version of this, I would have written, probably started thinking about like in 2011. Got it. Um, I would estimate. Yeah. No, I love the structure of this one. How the, I love that the, the in each section how the stanzas um, shrink, you know. From four lines to three to two to one. Very cool. You want to read that? Uh, that one? one is a, a little, um, well, I mean, I can. I mean, it's a bit longer. Let me well, see. if there's another one, again, we'll just refer people to the book. And then that, that poem's called As Lazarus Risen Like a Blossom from Bone. I'm trying, I'm trying to think, especially given like kind of the situation we're in <laughs> now. Or you could just grab one that um, that you're proud of. Okay, then I might read two. It wasn't until I was saying that, like something something that might feel or be more topical, um, that I, or at least I like, I kind of made like the cynic in me laugh because since this book, um, so much of it, it's ground or. Um, like the elemental forces going into what ma making it what it is comes comes out of two two biographical facts um, about me um, that we could think of as like in the sense of like the an alpha and an omega or um, like what the poet Frank Bedart might would call a radical given um, that that is a fact to or of extreme importance to identity or, you know, orientation, um, which is that I'm a preacher's kid um, and that I'm a queer preacher's kid or a, a gay man as well. Um, but of course, then you say that as well. And it's like, as if it's in addition to the one, like where does one begin and the other end? And, um, and like for any, individual made up of antagonist parts that are antagonistic to each other, whether that's, um, 
religious traditions, geographical areas, languages, nationalities. Um, and of course, and there are all kinds of complexities associated with them that For are sure. not the same. Um, but since the terrain of the book, um, the atmosphere is so, you know, is, is, is an attempt to evoke biblical time or sacred time a sense of time that has the feel of eternity or um, about it that we associate with like the iconic moments that occur in the Bible. Um, you know, that that would be somehow completely divorced from like the here and now. Um, I mean, and the here and now is the outlines, I guess, of what you might say is my life. Um, but at a kind of I, what I might call at a biblical remove in the same way that, you know, someone might consciously or unconsciously filter their experiences through the lens of a mythological figure, a folkloric figure, ekphrasis, um, writing about a painting, you know, about a, about a, about a work of art um, that, that did function as a kind of screen um, or mask or grid. So there are a series of poems that do that the most directly, which are poems that are written in the voices of biblical figures. And each of them begins with the word as, um, and, um, and I use, or I, after I had written one and titled it as so-and-so, as I got to thinking about it, I then realized, okay, well, if I do others, I want, I want them to all begin with that because it, it, it includes, but doesn't actually say a kind of implicit if, as if, where the I speaking, the voice, um, you know, could be construed as a visualization or an, an imagine, an imagining of Eve or Judas or, you know, any, any number of figures. Um, but it could also be read as like me writing in the voices of these figures too. So I'm going to read two of those that came mid, maybe midway through me realizing that I was kind of writing a series or something like a series and I, and I guess rightly or wrongly in terms of the definitions, for me, a sequence versus a series, typically, a sequence is a longer thing that appears one right after the other. Like it might be in 50 parts, but it's, um, uh, but you know, but they are sequential in the order of something and a series is not. So they're not necessarily going to, they're going to be related, but they're going to appear in an, in, a, in an order that maybe, you know, with a lot of distance between them. And then one that was one of the final poems written for the book. Incidentally, um, the first one, just because um, we might all say, you know, or I think we all can relate to being in the belly of a whale right now in one way, shape, form or another is about Jonah. Um, and it's called As Jonah Hours Into the Third Night Wondered. Measure the horizon this not night, not sky but spine, as if the ribs were sextants, no longer searching for even faint glimmers of some star other than the star shaped disk of the whole that neither sun nor moon never moves. Make even smaller fires of the hulks once ships. Write every man who's ever failed you, who you also failed. Tell them that there's more than soil. In sadness, all's ocean. But you can depend on salt, steadfast refrain. What water left you? A day as whole as a single grace note that field you remember, like the skin of your mother's face. How you found some fires burn even underwater, and everyone who forgot 
barnacles on their bones. You've never seen the bottom, but have felt its echolocation. Nostalgic for Green's ghost, what leaves promise that roots have also known the dark. And the other, which is on page 80, um, is titled, um, as the woman who grasped the hem of his garment. As the woman who grasped the hem of his garment was the no name woman who bleeds, was unclean, they said, claimed they the law, 12 years nonstop, ran red as the Nile, cursed between my legs, wound where nothing but dark came in, ruined my fortune, wasted on charms, cures, everything man-made failed. How could I not, having heard, go see if this God-made man could make me hail, breathless, among the throng, his eyes so ancient, so new, whirled like wind around. Who touched my robe? His disciple flock didn't. No, but he did. Had felt something. Kneeling, I cried, Lord. Somehow, I knew that if I could just, even the threadbare, dirt covered ends, not even the physical fact of his uncut nails, his miraculous hands that had set the lame walking again, who'd cast out the demon legion. Yes, these wondrous tales had crossed even my outcast ears. Cana wetting water into wine, the poor young man he wept for dead whose name, Lazarus, sounded like lightning, left a grave after one spoken word, lives again to tell. And I knew if I could clutch only the least, dirtiest part of his well-worn and traveled clothes, unwashed, homespun, even without seeing his face, without even Hearing his voice, my hand reached out, unsure if I could bear it, if he looked at me, not sure that I could stand. If he didn't see, I was utterly without hope if he would not, Adonai, if he could not. But he knelt beside he held onto and saw shame, scarlet, streaked. I couldn't hide because you believed that you would be healed, said this more than man, as if my whole body a bell beholds my beloved daughter, daughter, you have been. <laughs> I, I've, I've, been, I've, um, been, I've been wanting to press that button for a minute, John. No, this is great. And again, one um, of the things that, that your poems, and I, I love people that really utilize form. And yeah, the way you got these, these couplets broken up with that, that the, the spaces and those lines is uh, it's beautiful. And yeah, just the, the, the phrase, you know, the hyphenated God made man, and then later, more than man, it, you just little preci precise stuff like that. I get a little half chub over, man. That's great shit, great shit. Uh, but that's a well, sample of the of of of, uh, of John's poetry. You got to go grab that book though to get the rest of it with the with the dog star as my witness. And it's available as um, well. I mean, in electronic form too. I'm sure. Um, cool, cool. I don't have it. Like I don't have it on. Um, like on Kindle or anything like that, but <clears throat> yeah, that way people don't got to wait for it; they can just get it instantly. Um, 
Cool, man. I, I enjoy that. It's beautiful. Again, I really admire that book, man. I, I, I like that little book. It is, again, I, I like, uh, I like small books that are really heavy inside. And so, and so I really, I really like it. Yeah, I really like it. Well, I mean, and I feel like, I mean, I mean, this is, I mean, this comes out of my knowing you too, but I mean, I feel like that's the, I don't, I mean, I don't think of like the person in you who's a poet and the person who writes fiction are opposed or different people. Maybe it's kind of like one side of a pendulum versus another, but like, I feel like that's, like I would associate that with like the poet in each of us. Um, and certainly why, I mean, how one is able to get to the level of depth that is necessary to be worth diving in, in a short story as well. Um, and, yeah. And that's why I like the short stuff. And I've been grinding into some of the poetry stuff and digging up old poems and uh, that's been going well, but I do like the compact kind of form. Even the novel, I was like, I don't, I love a novel <laughs> under 200 pages, dude. Oh, a novel under 200 pages is sweet, man. Uh, I like these kind I like the compact nature of, uh, of that. And that poetry, you know, you <clears throat> get to excavate that moment or image or scene or something, right? right? That the, the depth is, is, is what's really interesting. Um, so since this is the Writers and Fighters podcast, it's always customary to ask my guests. Uh, so you're obviously a poet, a writer. You ever do any uh, fighting? You ever any wa- fighting? Wa- wander into a taekwondo class um, or something when you were a little kid? Or? As well, I mean, as <laughs> is probably well. Well, actually, I don't think as much of a surprise if we're just going on stereotypes alone to any of the fighters out there for sure, uh, but probably not the many of the writers either. Um, I am much more of a lover than a fighter. <laughs> However, yes, when I was a little kid, um, I did uh, take Taekwondo. Oh, um, oh, cool. starting, starting when I was probably in the third grade. That's good age for that. Stuff. And into like fourth i mean for, for a couple of couple years, years yeah. i got i got to the yellow belt yeah and taekwondo i think that's the second one um and i was beginning to do to learn forms to um to test for green All that stuff, uh, yeah. and was just starting to um, begin training with some weapons oh, like cool. the staff. Yeah, yeah the staff and um, everything, yeah. And, um, and then, and I think what happened is, I mean, I mean, I mean, I was a bullied kid. So, it, so in that sense, I mean, it was something that my parents <laughs> I was gonna say, supported. I, I was going to um, say, yeah, yeah. And because, and because I was also not an athletic kid, Typically, I liked being outdoors, but I was not interested in sports um, at all. Not interested. Um, and they learned that after they put me in t-ball uh, when I was, you know, kindergarten, first yeah. grade, maybe. Um, so, I mean, so, so certainly in that in that respect, in terms of self-defense, they, um, you know, um, I mean, supported that. Um, but I think it's because we moved. We lived in Hondo, Texas at the time. Yeah. And so the place, so where we went was in Castroville, um, which is, you know, maybe like 20 minutes. I mean, like not, I mean, I mean, a spit and a jump away from, you know, in terms of Texas time. But, sure. um, and then, and then my, and then my family moved to San Angelo. Um, and I think that I did continue it some into San Angelo, but I mean, but then, yeah, you know, it fell by the wayside. Um, but it is something that I have always admired and, and certainly loved and respected. Um, I mean, and I very much, even just the small amount that I, um, of experience I have, um, you know, it's very, I mean, I would call it an art in the same way that I would call, um, 
all of the many different things that a body can do or can make and produce, um, you know, um, I mean, I guess most clearly in relation to dance, sure, for but, sure. um, no, I mean, but definitely. even beyond that, um, I mean, and it, I mean, you know, I mean, and then it also has like an affinity with or a resonance or, um, there's a through line to me also into, um, Well, I mean, into religion and spirituality with with yoga and with tantra and um, sure, uh, you know, I mean, it just it 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 in a way that I well, I mean, I suppose the closest equivalent I do have, even though I am not um, on my mat as often as I should be now. I mean, is with yoga, yeah. um, which has more in common with Tai Chi, I think. Than, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, the, if it was going to be related a to martial, martial arts, art. it would be Tai Chi. But again, but it's uh, the, the body. Again, yoga really, I mean, all the MMA fighters and pro wrestlers are all busted up. Like, they're all about yoga now. Like, there's this really oh, interesting, sure. like, again, these um, kind of body guys and, and stuff are, are using uh, yoga to stay in shape and keep their backs and necks healthy and joints all good, well, you know? It's, Right. I mean, because because sure. all of all of those activities, I mean, and this is true, I mean, for, as with music, too. Sure. Um, I mean, and I think it's true for writing as well. But it is. Um, although writing does not do this in the way that music does. Um, that is a distinction I would make. And I think visual art, same thing. Um, it. allows you or forces you to be what um i mean what buddhist what what, what i mean like what what would a what what a buddhist like the whole or like like the dalai lama would say is 100 percent mindful of yourself in your body at that moment in time whether i mean whether you are in a in a sparring fight with someone else um, or meditating or yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you know, in my, in, in your bedroom, like I am, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. doing, uh, you know, doing yoga uh, through Amazon prime. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, but that, that, that attachment with the, what's the word, is it corporeal, the body, right? Mm-hmm. Like that attachment with like the mind and that the spirit really and the body. Uh, yeah. I think there's something to be said about that and that it is, um, you know, Taekwondo, yoga, all these things we do with our bodies, they, I do believe they are art and they're languages as well. You know, they have their own like right. language and, and yeah. terms of how do you manipulate the body. Um, speaking of language, before we uh, hit record, you had told me something really fascinating. And I, and it, it maybe will enlighten some of us in the fight game about where the word amateur comes from. You, oh. <laughs> you, you gave me such a lesson. I, I love learning um, something that's so interesting. Like, just really quickly. Um, okay, so um, you know, in, in AJ and I, um, who is, and I'm glad I get to like go on public forever record and saying this. AJ has been my favorite straight man to flirt with. <laughs> I was wondering if has, that was going to come up. If who like, has, did you realize how um, often you flirt with me has, on the internet? Who has been <laughs> the best? sport um i mean appropriately complimented and the best sport both since well since the fall of 2009 um <laughs> so for more than 10 years now, which is pretty pretty epic the only the only other person like or the only situation where you were a contender and not the winner is because i do have one straight guy friend from college <laughs> <laughs> who you would uh, you would actually get along great with? Um, <laughs> <We'd be bros. laughs> who is who is kind of like my first like straight boyfriend um, in that way? <laughs> straight space boy space <laughs> friend. Uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know. Anyway, um, but we were talking about in in all kinds of different situations. You know the the ins and outs and joys and difficulties of for those of us who can do this working from home in ways that we have not worked, worked at home before um, the kind of like the collapsing and the um, 
merging of um, personal lives and professional lives, particularly for people like AJ and me, who write ourselves and teach writing to others. And so it's naturally going to already cross pollinate. Um, and the kinds of pressures that we exist under to be professional, like if you smoke or vape um, and you're at home and you're teaching from home now on Zoom, is it professional or not to vape in front of your class? I mean, and I made the decision that for me, a part of I mean, like, even though I'm totally cool with my students calling me John, um, that kind of crossed some kind of decorum line for me that I was not willing to cross. Yeah. Um, now, in office hours, yes. Yeah. Um, but, like, teaching time, no. Um, or that kind of teaching. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, and, you know, and, and, and also how in, um, in different things, like in fighting or... Um, would it be called, is it kickboxing or, or MMA or? So, uh, yeah, well, so mixed martial arts uh, is like okay. what you see on the UFC in the cage, but then there's also boxing and kickboxing, karate and taekwondo. Mm-hmm. And most of these things that there is the amateur level and the professional right. level, right? And many, and of course, then many, if not, I would imagine most of the professionals were amateurs at one point correct and probably were also some of them amateurs for a significant period of time correct or who put their dues in as it were and you know i mean and just kind of like that different level of cool or accomplishment or knowing what you're talking about Mm -hmm. um and how you know in our kind of business businessified um, I feel like I feel like philosophers have a term for this, but like mm-hmm. the way business lingo and jargon is so much a part of our world now and whatever. Um, in, well, and Marxists have a lot to say about it too. industrialized. Um, you know, the professional has come to be seen, occupies a space uh, um, or a position in our, I think, just kind of in society. Um which I will kind of further stipulate like Anglo-American Protestant work ethic driven capitalism, capitalist society, um, you know, holds the professional at a higher level of esteem than the amateur. Um, And there is often a kind of line in the sand of coolness where one ends and the other begins. And some professionals, might also have like dalliances or relationships in the um, amateur side. Um, But in certain areas, that's not considered to be good. Um, And of course, I mean, and even for us as writers who both have taught creative writing, but then have also taught in the language of the academy, non-creative writing, rhetoric, composition, Mm -hmm. lit 101, you know, how to analyze poems, um, you know, where, being personal, being personally affected by the work that you do, um, you know, is not supposed to, you know, enter into the discussion. Um, And the word amateur, deriving from Latin, um, the root, one of the roots of the word, the prefix, uh, A-M-A, is related to the words like amor or amor, love in Spanish, amor in French, all of those derivatives um and and similarly um you know is kind of like loving or having that kind of passion for something is um is a part like it's built in um or encased in amber however we want to think about it but it is like it it, it is it is inlaid within the word we are using um or that, 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 that describes something that we are involved in or that we belong to, you know, whether it's poetry slams, open mic night to sing songs, um, you know, I mean, and the only people, I mean, I mean, you know, whether you're willing to admit it or not, the only reason people like that go and share and put themselves out there is because they have an investment of some, because it matters to them or because 
there someone is there because it matters to someone they care about, right? Sure, sure. Uh, that they're that they're you know they're connected to as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that, that. So I mean, it really kind of oh. it all boils down to love in a way. Um, you know, these these sorts of things. Um, you know, that occupy our time and our lives. I mean, like my equivalent maybe would be to fighting and to wrestling and MMA and, and whatnot. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of one. Well, I mean, I'm a gamer. I play video games sure. or, I, or I play like um, MMORPG style right. games, um, you know, um, and you know, and again, you know, I mean, it's, it's something, um, you know, we, we pursue, we follow our bliss as it were, because, because of those very reasons. Um, and in the spirit of love, if I, if I may, I want to, I want to share, or I'd like to read a poem by someone else no, please. Um, that I have, that I have kind of been holding on to these, well, <laughs> these past four years for sure. Uh -huh. um, and I'm, and I actually am thinking about using a part of this um, as the epigraph for, um, or as a kind of gravity inducing quotation uh, for um, a manuscript that I am working on that, kind of has two different titles at the moment. Um, one of them is uh, Terco, Mi Amor, uh, <laughs> and the other um, is Weather Effects. Um, and I love Weather Effects for how accurate it is, and I hate that it's the same initial, the same letter as the Dog Star book. <laughs> And there's a part of me, like a compulsive part of me, that does not want to let that happen <laughs> again. Anyway, um, but this is um, this is a poem from um, Estado de Exilio or State of Exile by uh, Cristina Peri Rossi, who is um, an a Uruguayan um, poet, or originally from Uruguay, and who has lived in Spain for the past several decades. Uh, basically, when um, you know, fascist totalitarian shit went down, mm -hmm. um, kind of like so many of the uh, so many writers of the Latin American boom generation, that includes like Cortazar. Um, well, I guess Borges would have been was a bit older, but like Cortazar and um, Marquez, um, and I'm. Others are escaping me, sure. but like Rossi was friends with Cortazar, for example. Cool. Uh, so anyway, so she's been in Europe since, um, and she wrote this book-length poem sequence um, within within a, a year or two of her immigration, uh, which she spent time in France. In, as a kind of, as, as a literally as a stateless refugee, um, eventually, um, or she was in Spain, but it was Franco Spain still, so she had to get out. <laughs> and, um, but it wasn't published, so in the 70s, and it wasn't published until 2008. Um, wow. And, and this, and City Lights did this great edition. Um, it's, it's dual language which is the basically like the only way I will publish or I will buy a book um, originally written in Spanish oh, yeah. in the U S side by side. Like I, I love that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and for me, especially, uh, but anyway, so I've been reading this again. Um, and, um, and it's actually kind of one, one of the, or I guess a passion of mine that I have kind of decided to try to channel toward um, making in line with the podcast um, you know, a, a year or two ago, I, I realized that um, if I thought about like Mexican poetry um, of the country, um, you know, a couple of names immediately came to mind. I mean, certainly Sor Juana de la Cruz, um, Octavio Paz, um, Jose Emilio Pacheco. Um, and then it kind of, at least in my ignorance, tapered off but in terms of like names that i saw 
thrown around in the different circles of the um, American, North American poetry community. That was often where it, you know, started and stopped. And of course, knowing that, um, you know, knowing that there is just no conceivable way uh, that, um, you know, there aren't people around our age, like writing and publishing books in that country. Like it just, of course, there was no way that that's not happening, but, find learning about it and learning learning you know who names where to look anyway um and also how much of it had been was available in english was available for an audience that does not read spanish um and realizing how small it is um and there are presses doing amazing translation work that is very valuable um but because they're small presses, I mean, to some extent, you know, their footprint is small. Um, but, but anyway, and so I started, um, you know, basically doing, I mean, it be, because I have enough facility, you know, to be able to like search the web in Spanish uh, <laughs> and read in Spanish. I mean, you know, I just basically went looking, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I have found um, several poets, um, you know, whose work is interesting to me. I mean, I mean, because, and I should say, uh, you know, contemporary Mexican and especially queer Mexican poets, um, you know, like if I had to describe a sweet spot, that's what it would be. Um, and I have, you know, encountered, um, you know, and found un- um, several um, and have, and have even corresponded with two in particular, um, it's awesome. And um and I intend have started but really would like to try to uh to translate their work. Um awesome. and um and try to get it published. Um I mean certainly in periodical form, but I mean but, but sure. like a yeah. book book too. There you go. Um so let's hear it. Um but anyway, so this is uh number twenty four of State of Exile, and I'll read it in Spanish. Um, and then I'll read it in English. Um, and I do occasionally get, you know, the act, the emphasis wrong, but so number 24, uh, 24. Nuestra venganza es el, es el amor, Veronique. Te dije aquella noche en Pont de Ar, el frío no hacía temblar las manos. El frío, el amor, Desear un café con leche calentito que me costara cinco francos. Mientras buscábamos donde diablos echarnos a dormir esa noche sin atraer a los flicks. Y tú chupabas hasta el tuétano, hasta el capullo, el último cigarrillo de la caja. Es seguro que nuestra venganza será el amor. Poder amar, todavía poder amar, a pesar de todo, a pesar de según, sin dónde, cómo, cuándo, pero antes, te juro, me dijo Veronique. Me gustaría, me gustaría mucho mandar a la mierda a unos cuantos hijos de puta, de manera indolora, claro está porque soy civilizada y hago el amor con preservativo. Love is our revenge, Veronique. I told you that night on the Pont de Art, the cold made our hands shake, the cold and love. Longing for a hot café con leche that wouldn't cost five francs, we continued looking for where the hell we might sleep that night without attracting the flicks, and you sucked away on the last cigarette in the pack down to the butt. I'm sure that love will be our revenge. To be able to love, still. To be able to love, in spite of everything. In spite of circumstances, without, where, when, how. But first, I swear to you, Veronique said to me, I would like, I would really like to send some of those sons of bitches to hell, painlessly, of course, because I am civilized and I make love with a condom. 
It Super just dope. slays Super dope. me. <laughs> That's really good. Good translation too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 For sure. Very um, cool, man. You know, in her, you know, one of the things that I have done, you know, she's in her, I think, 70s now. Mm-hmm. She's, um, you know, one of our cherished elders of the world. Um, oh, and the other thing I should say that I love and res- that I love and it resonates with me about her work um, is that she is a lesbian. Oh, there you go. Uh, Rossi is. Um, it, you know, among the money I have spent on books, um, has included a number of her novels because she's I mean she's prolifically published great. fiction as well as poetry I love it. Um, a lot of it I mean of course a lot of the Spanish language versions are coming out of Spain okay um, but but still relatively accessible uh, right. you know short story collections um, you know I've definitely been spending way too much money on books um, <laughs> but I have in some of my bibliomania, um, I have also supported small presses. Oh, there you go. <laughs> some yeah, of the one time, of those things. Yeah, it's you hard. know, I it's mean, hard, I, man. You know, it's hard sometimes. I, I, I've also tried to do that when when I can. No, yeah, when we can, again, you hit hit up your independent bookstore or independent bookstores that have uh, online storefronts. If we can avoid the the Bezos trap. But again, I'm the guy that I have a a list of stuff on my Amazon wish list that I'm like, Oh, "Oh, let me read one book and then buy three. And you know, it's, it's hard, but, but yeah, support your small presses and small bookstores for sure. Hey John, so where can people, well, well, then even some, you know, online ones like, um, better world books is one of my favorite, like online used bookstores, partly because they basically always offer free shipping, but they also, do a lot with literacy and so books that you buy it kind of pays it forward yeah they put it back to the community or to people put in front of yeah people who need them um no love it all that stuff is is super important whatever gets people reading uh whatever we can do to help that that is our duty as well so man uh where can people find you and catch up with you and, and 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 make sure they they uh they see when your stuff's coming out and all that stuff well, um, although I don't post on it very often, um, I do have Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find me under my name and my Instagram is um, at Wonder Thicket. Mm-hmm. So the word wonder and the word thicket spelled mm-hmm. together. <laughs> um, I am on Facebook. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Um, um, again, under my name, um, you know, I mean, my, my Facebook, like a lot of ours, I think, is, you know, it's kind of a blend of personal connections, family, friends, as well as some that kind of cross into my professional the life as world. well. Yeah. Um, I, um, I have a Twitter that I don't really use. Um, and then on the more academic side of things, um, I have an academia.edu page. Um, again, under my name, um, and, um, you know, and, 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 in, and in all of those, I mean, you, of course, I mean, I can be messaged in all of those channels. Um, and if you, of course, I mean, you know, through, um, I mean, you know, through AJ or, um, you know, I mean, if you, if you have a connection to me through the writing world, um, which on Facebook wouldn't be that surprising. No, yeah. It's um, hard to hide at a certain point. At a certain you know, point, if um, it's you know, like... I can easily be. You know, I can be found and gotten in touch with pretty easily, I think. Yeah, yeah I think you're easily Googleable, right? John Fry, poet badass, and there it comes up, first hit. Boom, boom. All right, buddy boy. I enjoy this talk, man. Yeah, me too. Yeah, if only we could so be much. Thank if you only for we could, having me. If only we could be hanging out in a you know, San Antonio, you know. Uh, I know. I know. Well hopefully I mean, well hopefully the next time that the world allows for um, you to be down here in San Antonio visiting your sister. Mm-hmm. Since I imagine your dog would be coming too. hundred percent. Then yes. Like, <laughs> and the dog sweetens a totally deal, man. <laughs> go to, go to a dog park and like go to some restaurant where, you know, you can sit outside with your dog. Hell yeah, man. We'll get blessed. there. We'll get there one day, man. All right, buddy boy. Hey, well, be good, man. We enjoyed this talk, and uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah. 
You're so welcome. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to that interview. I hope you enjoyed it. Go pick up John's book, With the Dog Star as My Witness by John Fry. Just a good dude and super talented poet. You can get that book at maybe your indie bookstore. Call them up. Maybe give them some business. They might be hurting. If you want it immediately, you can always just go digital and just put it on your Kindle or on your phone. If you want to keep up with John Fry, you can take a look at the show notes. I will have all his, in- his uh, info there for social media. As far as Riders and Fighters, you can follow us on all social media. Just type in Riders and Fighters into your search bar. You can also go to ridersandfighters.com. All the links are there as well. Go on Spotify or iTunes and leave us a rating and thumbs up and all that jazz. Stay tuned next week. Uh, in about a week, I'll be releasing another podcast, an interview with Anja Stridman. She's a boxer uh, out of Australia, a Swedish boxer that trains out of Australia now and won the 2018 Commonwealth Games, a gold medal in that. And so it was a really treat to talk to her. So stay tuned next week, y'all. Until then, you guys be good to each other and be safe. Peace.